Last week we talked about Five Nights at Freddy's and its unique horror mechanics, specifically its security camera system. And for those of you who are wondering, after I slowly descended into madness at the end of last week's episode, I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. Let's see what you had to say. So right off the bat, I wanna talk about the new Five Nights at Freddy's part four in the series. It switches up the formula, as a lot of you pointed out. It doesn't have a security camera system, which a lot of you pointed out, and I barely alluded to it in the episode, which a lot of you pointed out. So here's what happened, is that while we were scripting this episode, an announcement trailer started making the rounds, and then after the episode was in post-production, that means I had already shot it, it was being edited, Five Nights at Freddy's Part 4 actually came out, at which point it was unfortunately a little late to make changes. The timing, not ideal. So anyway, it's not that we were trying to consciously ignore it or anything like that, it just, you know, it didn't really line up the way that we had sort of hoped, but we thank you for your patience. The second thing I wanna talk about is the backlash. Not the backlash against Game Show, but the backlash against the new Five Nights at Freddy's. It was really untimely to release the episode this week because as we see in this Steam user review, many, many fans of the series expressed their feelings that the series had become redundant and that this has swelled and attracted ranks of dissenters on the internet. It's gotten a little bit ugly. It got so bad that Scott Cawthon issued a statement addressing criticism aimed at him, defending his work ethic and quality of his games, saying that people should work on creating rather than tearing down. So I get that some of you might be really, really unhappy and disappointed, um, but uh, just try to remember, and this is speaking as someone who used to work as a music critic, criticism is super important, but it's also really important to try to be uh, constructive, not necessarily positive, but constructive and don't go for personal attacks. I'm speaking from personal experience. So, hey, so if you're feel like you're really, really upset by the new Five Nights at Freddy's, write Scott Cawth on a note, but try to be cool about it. Monkey Pants Face, bravo, bravo. That is some A plus YouTube handling. Anyway, Monkey Pants Face says the reason that many people are drawn to Five Nights at Freddy's is the lore of the game instead of the mechanics. This is, there's an entire episode by a map pad at Game Theorist specifically about the lore, which a lot of you referenced. Um, but the idea is that the game purposely, the game is weaves a purposely vague and obscure narrative that draws people into the mystery of what happened at Freddy Fazbear's. And I totally agree with you that this is a big viral element and is a large part of its success, which ties in the way that people share the game over the internet. In fact, we've talked about this in the past. We did an episode on what's called environmental storytelling in Dark Souls. That's where you leave these little like narrative nuggets for people in, in the world itself, for people to find and then eventually to discuss over the internet. It's a tradition that dates way back to say like Magic the Gathering, which gave you little tidbits about this world that you were sort of uh, um, living in. Anyway, it's a really successful, it's a really successful narrative technique and it's cool to see uh, to see Five Nights at Freddy's employ it. Dean892 says that while they've never played a Five Nights at Freddy's game themselves, they've watched it be played many, many times before and that they're the scariest games that this person has ever watched. This is living proof of the idea I talked about in the episode about how the mechanics of Freddy's perfectly pairs watching and playing and how the games are becoming this medium of performance. By that, I just mean that the act of playing Five Nights at Freddy's is almost, almost identical to the act of watching somebody play Five Nights Nights at Freddy's, and that's a very, very different type of spectated experience. Uh, this person also says that they have a personal fear of things coming to life, and I totally feel you, buddy. I saw Poltergeist a long time ago, it really scared the crap out of me. So we're in the same boat there. Vrace Zinirvana, which is an amazing and hopefully true name, points to the director Alfred Hitchcock, who I summoned in the episode, who made this amazing distinction between suspense and surprise in terms of cinema, and uh, points to a great quote about it. So in summary, Hitchcock basically says that when an audience is aware that a bomb is about to go off, they become much more involved in the scene, opposed to if the bomb just exploded with no presentiment and just surprised everyone. Hitchcock says, and I quote, in these conditions, the same innocuous conversation becomes fascinating because the public is participating in the scene. And that's why Five Nights at Freddy's is so compelling. I think it's interactive without per se being interactive. And that goes for the lore and the scenes and the exchanges between the viewer and the player. Patrick Higgins says that Five Nights at Freddy's is interesting because it flips the tables on traditional power structures, which for those of you who watch game show on a regular basis, you know that's something I've talked about a lot. So usually it's the person who's in the position of power who gets to spy on others and make them feel fear and paranoia. Um, and Patrick actually brings up the architectural concept of panoptical prisons, which were these giant old circular prisons that were designed so that a single watchman could sit at the center and it was possible to see in any direction. So that gave one person a lot of power over a large group of others. Also, these prisons were designed so that the prisoners didn't know if they were being watched at any given moment. And so what's interesting is that while Five 
Nets and Freddy's is essentially the same setup. It's terrifying because the prisoners are animatronic robots who are revolting. I'm sure a lot of you already knew about the panoptical architectural roots of Scott Cawthon's game design in Five Nights at Freddy's, so I'm not sharing anything new, I'm sure. Twilight Vigilix makes this amazing point that Five Nights at Freddy's hits this sweet spot where the content is rated low enough so that little kids can play it, but the actual scares are legitimately scary beyond what normal limits may allow. And Twilight Vigilix is someone who would know this person works with kids. So I think this gets at some of the stuff I've talked about, uh, talked about in previous episodes that um, this writer Hannah Rosen had outlined, which is that kids want a sense of danger, but also a sense of security at the same time. She wrote this amazing piece for The Atlantic called The Overprotected Child, um, which I'll link to in the description. And it was actually the foundation of an episode we did a while back on Minecraft, um, which I also recommend. But basically what Rosen is arguing is that kids need six different types of risky play for childhood development, but there's one on offer from Friday, uh, Five Nights at Freddy's that is being near dangerous elements. It's one of the things that kids like, such as fire or ocean. But being near it, but also being far away from it that they sort of are not actually in harm's way. And Five Nights at Freddy's offers that sense of fear, but within the safety, uh, safe kind finds of what's available on the App Store.